So in previous lessons, I mentioned that there existed this Anglo-German rivalry as we lead up to the beginning of the First World War. And what I want to do is explore these ideas in a little bit more detail, just to give us a bit more of an understanding of mainly the causes of the First World War from a theoretical perspective. So we will focus when we look at the causes of the First World War in more detail on actual events that take place that lead up to conflict um, uh, breaking out. But for now, let's just carry on focusing on some more um, theoretical ideas behind the causes of the war. Now that we've outlined the nature of the alliance structures that existed, so the Central Powers and the Triple Entente, um, these existed within Europe at the beginning of the First World War, this lesson is going to look at the idea that there existed this Anglo-German rivalry. We already know that there existed a French-German rivalry after the defeat of France in 1870. We know that there existed an Austro-Hungarian and Russian uh, rivalry because Russia saw themselves as protectorate of the Slavs and Austria-Hungary seemed to be quite hostile to a number of different Slavic states such as Serbia. But what about the Anglo-German rivalry? Where does this come from? Well, it was caused by a number of factors. So firstly, Britain had gone about detaching itself from international relations during the period that we note to be the splendid isolation during the majority of the 1800s. We mentioned this in the previous lesson. Now, what this would allow for is Germany to use the fact that there existed this power vacuum because Britain was not part of international relations to enter into the stage in 1871 as a major world power and essentially taking the place of Great Britain. Now, this is exaggerated by the fact that the leader of Germany, the, the, the monarch of Germany, Kaiser Wilhelm II, wanted to expand German influence across the world as well. So not only was uh, Britain becoming more and more isolationist in the 1800s, but Germany was becoming more and more expansionist. Both of these ideas culminate in Germany growing in power significantly with Britain on the international stage um, having a, a lot less power, especially within Europe as well, specifically. And given the fact that we're talking about an Anglo-German rivalry, we have to mention the fact, um, or at least mention and introduce the study of Kaiser Wilhelm II as well. So Kaiser Wilhelm II was born in 1861 and arguably suffered brain damage at birth. Now, it is debated by historians whether or not this is actually the case, whether or not there's um, substantive evidence that this is the case, but there is an argument and a debate to be had. He was uh, related to a number of monarchs and monarchies around Great Britain because he was the nephew of King Edward VII and the cousin of the soon-to-be King George V. They were all... Um, you can actually see the descendants of a lot of the monarchs of the great empires during the First World War were actually descendants of Queen Victoria in some way. So Queen Victoria is the reason why uh, the monarchs of Great Britain are related to Kaiser Wilhelm II, who is the reason why that they are also related to the Tsar in Russia, Tsar Nicholas II. Now, Kaiser Wilhelm II himself had a number of aims within the realm of foreign policy. Like I mentioned, he wants to play a greater role in international politics. He saw himself and he saw Germany as one that ought to be increasingly expansionist, developing more economic communities around the world as well, with greater trade and colonialism and imperialism around the world, a growth of the German Empire. The acquisition of colonies and the aggressive foreign policy uh, was known within the um, within Germany as the Weltpolitik um, ideas uh, of expansionism. Now, apologies for the, for the pronunciation, um, but that is essentially what we see as the sort of broad collection of policies that are increasingly expansionist, that are increasingly imperialistic and increasingly aggressive in terms of colonies around the world. Now, one of the main developments of this aggressive foreign policy was the creation and building of a larger navy, as I mentioned in the first lesson. And this was something that led to a greater rivalry with Great Britain. So naval developments were very interesting because Great Britain was an empire that, great, uh, that placed a great amount of pride in the supremacy of its navy. Now, there are a number of historical, geographical reasons why this is the case. One of the reasons being the fact that Great Britain is an island nation and an island empire. Um, it suggests that, of course, in order for Britain to exert its influence, it had to do so on the sea. And so therefore, we see a growth in the British naval um, supremacy across the world and a certain pride a sense of pride that is um, that is placed in the hands of the german uh, sorry in the uh, british uh, naval um, capacities 
Now, for the Kaiser, naval developments was vital for the supporting of global trade. So it was not necessarily a sense of pride and duty to grow its navy in any meaningful way to try and compete with Great Britain. That may have been a subsidiary reason why the Kaiser wanted to to grow the navy, but it did it. But it held more functional purposes. He wanted to grow, uh, sorry, grow global trade. He wanted to gl- <laughs> to grow uh, imperialism and to and to expansion uh, to expand essentially great uh, the German Empire across the world. And so, therefore, in order to do that, you have to have greater naval expansion. Now, Great Britain would ultimately respond to the German naval announcement in 1906 by launching the development of a new class of battleship. These will become known as the HMS Dreadnought. And now, to this day, um, the idea of a Dreadnought is something that is uh, seen to be a, a great major battleship. It's the sort of colloquial term for a big battleship. But originally, the HMS Dreadnought was a specific class of battleship that was developed in 1906. Now, in response to this, Germany would respond by introducing their own class of dreadnoughts. And so we see in the early 1900s somewhat of an arms race when it came to naval capacities with the great British dreadnoughts uh, equaling up to 29 um, by 1914 compared to that of 17 by Germany. So even though Britain won this naval supremacy battle, they didn't win um, so so significantly with Germany also uh, developing a huge number of battleships. Now, we will see that as, um, well, we we might not see this in in any great sense in this particular series of lessons, but in history, we see that as 1914 and 1918, um, we go through that period, we go through the end of the First World War, we go into the Second World War, the actual significance of battleships would begin to diminish significantly and be replaced with the significance of aircraft carriers. So, even though during the First World War battleships were very important, this would not be something that lasts for a very long time. 